So, Professor Muller, thank you very much for coming along today. And uh, the first thing I'd like to ask you, as someone who's been involved in research a long time, but also involved in this whole design kind of discussion in the United States, can you just tell us what is the difference between this general idea of design, the idea that God has made a beautiful world and it's well designed, and that kind of idea, which has been around for centuries, and this newer idea of intelligent design? What's the difference between those two things? Well, I think th the biggest difference is that the overall design argument is one that in many ways is quite consistent with what we understand from science. And what I mean by that is the design argument basically calls attention to the regularities we see in the universe, as you mentioned, the beauty of the world and existence around us, the fact that the universe can actually be investigated by natural law and runs according to natural law. And many people would interpret that in a way that says, you know, this is consistent with what I think of when I think of a created universe and the presence of a creator. Now, the intelligent design movement superficially sounds like the same thing. And in fact, I think coining the anti-evolution movement that really started in the United States with the label of intelligent design was a master stroke of political labeling and marketing. Because when you look closely at the advocates of intelligent design in the United States, and many of them have now spread their ideas to Europe and to other parts of the world, what they actually constitute is an anti-Darwinian movement. And let me try to be specific about that. The particular arguments in the intelligent design movement basically say that complex biochemical systems, uh, molecular machines that consist of multiple parts, complex pathways involved in biosynthesis and processes like the clotting of the blood and the generation of the immune re reaction, these complex systems have so many parts that step by step Darwinian evolution could not account for them. Therefore, they have to be the product of an intelligent designer. Now, the interesting thing about that argument is the word design, in many ways, is a cover for what these folks actually mean. Because let's take the proteins that clot our blood. There's a marvelous system of anywhere from 16 to 18 proteins that are involved in the clotting reaction, which keeps all of us, all of the time, from bleeding to death. When you say they were designed, you not only mean that those proteins were the product of an intelligence, but that intelligence also had to physically fashion the genes and the control systems responsible for producing those proteins. Now, those systems couldn't have just been designed. They had to be created. And it's also true when the advocates of intelligent design point to evolutionary novelties in the fossil record, when they point to the first complex animals with hard body parts that appear in the Cambrian, or they point to the earliest mammals or even the earliest hominids and say these are the products of design, what they actually have to mean is that these particular organisms were in fact created, that the design was put into a concrete plan. And therefore, a fair description of what intelligent design means is in fact special creation. The notion that a creator designer intervened repeatedly throughout natural history to replace his previous creations, which by now had gone extinct, with new creations. And at the end of the day, what you have, a pa have is a pattern of creation, extinction, creation, extinction, creation, extinction, that for some ra strange reason looks remarkably like evolution. Mm. And this, this sort of resemblance of an evolutionary process is one of the reasons why this movement has gotten a very cold shoulder from the scientific community. Okay, so I know that you're a person of faith, you believe in God, and you believe in evolution. Now, how, how do you reconcile those two beliefs together? How do you put them together? Well, I very quickly say that I don't believe yeah. in evolution oh. any more than I believe in the Krebs cycle or I believe in DNA, right. because I don't think science is constructed as an article of faith. Mm -hmm. I accept the scientific evidence for the Krebs cycle and for DNA and also for evolution. Belief in a creator, I think, rises to a different level, and that is indeed fairly called belief. Um, the reason um, that I don't find these ideas in conflict, and people often ask me, how do you reconcile evolution with a belief in God, is that I don't find the two ideas that are not in conflict to begin with ever have any need of reconciliation. Because what evolution really tells us, when you back up for a second and think about what it means, is it tells us that the causes of the origins of species, including ourselves, are to be found in natural processes. Well, the creator, if he exists, is the author of nature and the designer of all of those natural processes. So saying that our species has a natural history just like any other species on this planet doesn't necessarily take the creator out of the picture because natural processes are his work as much as anything else. Mm -hmm. What that means then is you as a scientist, you're really someone who's 
also a believer who's really looking at your research as exploring God's world. Uh, in the American vernacular, I would say that's a very corny way to describe it. But as a matter of fact, that's what I actually think. Mm -hmm. I think the opportunity that any of us have to do science is a, a priceless privilege. I, I walk into the laboratory every morning and I sort of you know, mentally slap myself once or twice in disbelief that anyone will pay me to walk into a laboratory and say, what shall I try to discover today? It's extraordinary work. Mm -hmm. And part of that is the ability that any scientist knows to try to look a little further or delve a little deeper into the natural world than anyone has before. And even people who are themselves not people of faith will often describe the experience of scientific discovery as a kind of religious experience. So I think it almost goes without saying that someone who is a person of the faith certainly, of faith, certainly feels that way and perhaps even more so. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Professor Miller. My pleasure.